Sure, today is the Supreme Court hearing oral arguments in the case of the Church of the Sword versus the town of Westmoreland. As a matter of fact, I'd like to thank our attorneys, uh, Dan Hines and Wendy Spillane, and also the town of Westmoreland for providing this opportunity for us to secure religious liberty for the state of New Hampshire. And what we're hoping for today is that the Supreme Court will define religion. There's freedom of religion enshrined in the New Hampshire Constitution, but they don't say what it is. So hopefully that will happen after today's hearing. All rise for the Supreme Court Justices. Please be seated. The Hampshire Supreme Court is now in session. This is case 2015-0250, Church of the Sword versus Town of Westmoreland. Good morning, Dan Hines on behalf of Church of the Sword, and I ask to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court. Church of the Sword is a religion. They do things you would expect many religions to do. Religions to do. They have hundreds of members. They've been how many hundreds? Um, I believe um, the last point, uh, according to the affidavit, not four hundred fifty. They're four hundred fifty. Constantly growing. They've been religion for more than five years um, now. They have weekly services. They help the poor. They perform marriages. They just by what authority do they perform marriages? They are licensed under the state, or they're incorporated in New Hampshire as a church. That's the is that the authority, or is it a Justice of the Peace authority? They, I believe they have both Justice of Peace and also under the, or being incorporated in New Hampshire. Are, are all the members uh, in the town? No, all the members are not in the town. So they have different, their services are at different locations. So there are some members in the town of Westmoreland, but there are also members throughout the state. And their services are held throughout the state. And throughout the country? Um, to my understanding, the, their local religion at this point, um, everyone is in New Hampshire. One of the requirements to be a pastor is to, to be a drink, to be ordained, is to live in New Hampshire. So this point, in New Hampshire. How many pastors are there? They have. I'm not sure the exact number. Um, they're constantly, I can say, growing and have different processes of what it takes to be for a new pastor. So there are numerous pastors with the exact number. Of them. So, I, so I, can I just make sure I'm understanding there's, there, you said they have, they have services and members throughout the state of New Hampshire. Yes, sir. Um, and there are a number of pastors. Yes, sir. And do they, how many pastors live in this property or how? That, that is, that is uh, the subject of the tax Yeah, So there is one pastor that is being Mark Hedgington. He is the one occupying the property that would be purpose for tax exemption. Is he, is he the leader of, of the Church of the Sword or are there co leaders or how does that work? Yeah, so there's not a hierarchy such as Catholic, um, Catholic religion where there's a pope. So there's pastors and they have guidelines of the doctrines that they have to follow to become ordained as a pastor. There's not are those guidelines uh, part of the record that we have? Yes, they were submitted as um, the Church of the Swords affidavits on, it was on exactly the guidelines that they do use to choose the pastor. Well, what is the extent of the record is um, the church's interrogatory answers? And you just made reference to affidavits. Yes. They accompany the objection to the motion for summary judgment? So the affidavits at the trial court letter level were submitted both in the motion for summary judgment, I believe, as well as the opposition to summary judgment. And there was ultimately a motion to reconsider, which I believe had an affidavit filed or a copy with it as well. And so is that part and is that part of the record that we have that is all the affidavits? I am not positive if that was Sent transfer from the lower case, if not the affidavits that were filed with um, the town of Westmoreland, and covered pretty much 90% of it. The only supplemental affidavits stated how many members there were and went into on how it's in there. Well, I, guess, I mean, I guess it seems 
strikes me that that's relatively important. In other words, if you are saying that the trial court was wrong to grant summary judgment because the summary judgment record doesn't support what the trial court did, then as the appellant, it's your obligation to provide us with that record. So if, for example, you say the affidavits would show that there was a genuine issue of material fact, but you haven't give us, given us those affidavits, how do we, you know, our, our, our law is very clear that if you don't provide us with the record upon which we can we could rule that you are right, then you lose. I mean, that's, that's you know, there are, we've got a hundred cases that say that. So I guess I, I, it's really kind of important to know, have you given us those affidavits? I believe there's two sets of affidavits. I know both of them were filed with the trial court. I thought they would be part of the record transfer to the court. They don't, they don't okay. get transmitted by magic here. So you may want to check into that. And I would have to check if these second set of affidavits was filed. Uh, can I follow up on questions about casters? Are there rotating casters? In other words, is an individual a caster for a period of time and then he's replaced or once a caster, always a caster? Yes, yeah, so once you're a data caster, you're a caster, I suppose, at some point when you terminate as a caster, but it's not a set specific amount of time and you're not always caster. Say this church, you're free to be a caster at the other churches throughout the state. Who, the or, who ordained you? Yeah. I'm sorry. Who, who ordained a caster? Yep, so a caster is ordained by other casters and like I said, there is a specific set of criteria that you have to follow to ordain. And what's that? The specific set of criteria was laid out in the affidavit of the... I'm the, having trouble finding them. Did you know them? Or, um... I'll just do have it here. figure a, you know, a sort of super, supernatural in some way uh, 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 
figure that, that kind of guides human action? Correct, John. There could not be a litmus test of there being a creator or a god. So, in, so in other words, if I'm understanding correctly, that if you had a, a group uh, sort of like like the community that you described, but their their belief, their common belief was that there is no such thing as God. That's what they believe in, and they have and they have you know sort of rituals or something to 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 uh, uh, to, to propagate or, or whatever that that uh, point that would qualify as a religion. I think it, it, if they have something else, I think spirituality. It, Essential. I mean, I would suggest um, Buddhism has hundreds of millions of people. If they don't have a God, they're essentially working towards greater self-improvement. I suggest that's exactly what the Church of the Sword is doing. You suggest here that, in your brief, that uh, somehow discovery had not been completed. What other discovery or information would assist you in meeting your burden of proof? Possibly towards a viewpoint discrimination. So we're not at the lower, or in the first instance, the town did not say why they denied the religion. It came up for the first sense, or for the first time in the field. And if we could have shown, I don't know what the story would show, but it showed that they were denying their sword and ended up giving these um, tax exemptions to other religions, that certainly is a constitutional issue. So the town cannot favor one religion over the next. Couldn't you find that out from the public records? I don't think the denial or why a denial would be, uh, but again, we weren't able to address this because the discovery was not going to be. Well, what do you want? You want a trial? Yes, we want a trial. I think the issue of whether the religion is, is a factual issue. If it's not a factual issue, certainly the factors that they have presented are more than sufficient uh, to be or get around the motion. Then, then I find some, I understand maybe you're not the author of the brief, but then I find some incongruity in the brief where it says on uh, page 28 that uh, if the religious views espoused by the respondents might seem credible and not preposterous to most people, but if those doctrines are subject to trial before a jury, charged with finding their truth or falsity, then, some, then the same can be done with the religious beliefs of any sect. Isn't that inconsistent with the request for a jury trial here? Well, I think it goes to the United States, United States Supreme Court issue in Seeger, and we're asking the court to adopt the bright line rule that if it's a sincerely held belief, that is all that matters in religion. And how do we determine this is the sincerity? That is a factual issue. In this case, it hasn't even been disputed, and at this point, the verdict would be on that to show it was not sincerely, sincerely well, held belief. If, if you were to achieve a jury trial, as you're interested in, what instruction would the court give to the jury in making its determination? Yes, and the lower court recognized that there isn't much, that this is essentially an issue of first depression. We would ask that the court to make some finding. The court could say these are certain factors that the jury can consider, such as the factors the IRS standards use, or they could just use this bright line rule. If it's a sincerely held belief, then that is entitled to, entitled to religious protection. So in your view, sincerely held belief would be the only element that the jury would have to decide. That is certainly one court or one approach the court could take. It would, like I said, be a bright line rule. I think it supports the case law seeker and more recently the US Supreme Court um, hobby law decision where they deal with sincerely held beliefs. Does the pastor in this case have uh, another job? I do not know the answer to that. Do I understand correctly that there are a number of pastors that uh, reside in the town. That I specifically march at Mark is one for this property. I do not know the answer. But if, if you were to ultimately prevail, uh, at least as I understand it, ninety percent of the basis for this is that it's a parsonage for a pastor. Correct. And so if there were multiple pastors in the town and it would logically follow that they too would have parsonages that would be entitled to well, I think that has to be a separate property that would have to then apply to the town for that other property. I see my thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Sada Sumo. I represent the town of West uh, This case is somewhat unique 
please in my experience of motion for summary judgment because the basis for my application for summary judgment was the church will sort its own answers to interrogatories. Uh, when the issue of discovery arose, I found interrogatories. I think there was some delay in getting them back. Now that we received them in the interrogatories, uh, then I filed a motion for summary judgment. It was not a motion filed, uh, which I have seen in the past where party says that I'm prepared to answer a motion for summary judgment because they need to do discovery and in my experience where that motion is presented to the court. And so what is the summary judgment record in this case? It's the answers to interrogatories. That I propounded to the church of the school. With no affidavits. With, with my affidavit right. saying that these are the answers right. Got that. made under oath. But Do we have affidavits from the other side? What? Do we have affidavits from the other we side? We don't. We do not have an affidavit as such from the other side in opposition. They filed an objection and then they filed a memorandum. And then at the end of the, end of the memorandum, there was a oath. An the state, but see. there was not an affidavit as such that blended the arguments of law with the statement of fact. So, in yeah, tab three, is that uh, memorandum? Yes. Mr. Bloom has a certificate at the end. And, uh, do I, even though this copy isn't signed, was that a was a signed copy filed in the court that was signed by Mr. Bloom under penalties of perjury or sworn swearing to it? What we have isn't signed, but I do well, I understand. I made the assumption that what was submitted to the court was signed. I, I cannot, from my own uh, recollection of the file, now uh, what well, we Well, we, whatever we have, we have. So I just wanted to understand um, what we have is not signed. But your recollection is that it was signed? Well, I do not have a recollection of what I'm saying. Uh, and I would note that. So we, we can just follow up. So we can, should we understand that, that that other than that signed under oath memorandum objecting to summary judgment, there is there are no other affidavits that were ever filed in the, in the trial. There are, there are no other affidavits. I mean, there's no discovery pending. And there was no discovery request pending. I used the Church of the Swords answers to interrogatories to file a motion because I felt that. Their answers to interrogatories did not establish that they met the statutory criteria for this property to be exempt from taxation. What do you what do you say about your opponent's position that, that one of the things that the court talked about was that this was not a regularly re recognized religion, but there seems to be some language in at least some U.S. Supreme Court cases that say that that you know whether it's been sort of long recognized or regularly recognized cannot be. Uh, that can't be the be all then. Well, my comment is is that we're dealing with the New Hampshire statute. And that's what the New Hampshire statute requires. I would also point out that when I asked the inquiry of the Church of the Sword as to the tenets of the religion, it means four sources. One is a foundation for the martial arts. Well, if that is a source of religion, then I suggest every temple, every every store from that that teaches karate would qualify on that basis. Keep going. The other the other one was uh, the strategies of war, uh, the, the Chinese war. The third one is um, uh, was was uh, Lao Tse, uh, the I Ching, Lao Tse, uh, which is sort of foundation for Confucianism, as I understand, uh, religious thing. The fourth, the fourth one was a German philosopher who uh, basically is, I understand, the foundation of individual anarchism. That is a direct refutation of the concept that you have any organized religion. I mean, why, how, why, you know, again, why is that so? Why do you say that? Because if, if, if one is an anarchist, an individual espousing individual anarchism, and one is not part of any group or body, 
one is refuting the idea that there is a community. And the idea of religion, whether it's monotheistic or polytheistic, is that you have an organized community that has a sense of common purpose with those standards and values. The espousal of individual anarchism basically says there's no tether, no common core structure. It's a refutation of, I, I think, the, the, the sort of basic tenets. Aren't you, making, it, aren't you making a value judgment there? I, I think I'm taking the words as they make, as they, in their ordinary meaning. Well, so, some, so if, if we take, if we accept that, that would mean that somebody couldn't say, I'm a Catholic, for example, and I'm also an anarchist. You right. can't be both. That would be a correct statement. But I would also point out that I, you know, on that basis, I think anybody could, could, could apply. You know, the argument here is, frankly, that uh, they can declare that they're a religion, set forth a confusion, a conglomeration of ideas, that some of which are just internally inconsistent, and then qualify for the religious exemption, which I, I don't think that's the intent of the statute. Because if you examine, you go through an intellectual process, and examine what they're espousing, it, it, it's a mismatch of things. Well, you, you, the problem I guess I have, uh, Mr. Wilk, is this. I, it, you may ultimately be correct. I'm, I guess, frankly, I'm a little concerned that this is something that the court can properly decide for summary judgment. I mean, it may be one of the things, as Justice Conway pointed out, that it seems to be the, the U.S. Supreme Court case law talks about it. One thing that at least can be required is, is proof by the proponent of the religion that if the religion that the views are sincerely held, that presumably could be something that could be explored by a fact finder. I'm, I, I guess I have some question about whether the record here is sufficient to say as a matter of law that these things, that this organization doesn't follow. Well, the problem I have with, and I understand the court's reluctance, but I, I use their answers to interrogatories to try to show that they didn't meet the statutory requirements. Now, they have an obligation in answering interrogatories to give me complete answers, that they can't just go back on them or deny them or try to say that, that, that I wasn't entitled to rely upon them. And I think their answers to interrogatories establish that yeah, you know, in my estimation, uh, that this is more akin to a book club that meets once a month and reads, you know, reads a book and then meets at the library and has a book discussion. You know, frequently in other arenas, let's take a medical malpractice case, interrogatories may tell only part of the story, and frequently counsel will take depositions to flesh out the summary judgment record. The town chose not. Take well, if the I understand that we chose not to take depositions. I, I felt the answers to interrogatories combined with the statutory provision, which places the burden of persuasion and proof on the taxpayer to establish that they're eligible for the exemption. What What do we do then with the U.S. Supreme Court's case law? Uh, as I have it from my notes here, um, the standard, standard articulated is whether the beliefs professed by the individual church and members are sincerely held and whether they are, in the individual scheme of things, religious. Can we really answer that question with the interrogatory answers? Well, I think within the individual scheme of things, we can. And I would also point out that I believe the Supreme Court cases, if I recall, recall, recall the actual existence of a church, the, ch the church property, and where it was actually being used as a, as a uh, place of community and, and worship. We're, we're not talking about this here. We're talking about an individual's residence and the desire of that individual to avoid paying property taxes in the town of Westmoreland. And, and I would point out. And I don't know whether the court had any experience with this, but somewhere in the late, in the early 80s, they're going through the Manhattan out there, there were several individuals who were selling to people the idea that they became a pastor 
and that they then didn't have to pay internal taxes to the Internal Revenue Service. Unfortunately, individuals selling that package didn't get prosecuted, but there were many individuals who bought that package and then failed to file the federal tax returns and got prosecuted for criminal and civil for failure to file taxes. Do we, do we understand, I, I, your, your, your point right, right there was that there was not, the, the request for an exemption is for the parts, the parsonage, which is actually the place where one of, the, the, one of these individuals lives, but when services, are services also held at that parsonage, at least from time to time? The answers to interrogatories, I asked that they, they, the answers to interrogatories, which I put in the way of, because they were not included. They're in your appendix. Yeah, they're in my appendix. It says, uh, it's interrogatory. All buildings, it's interrogatory 14, it's in the appendix. All buildings are used continuously as parsons and parsonage stores. The land is used for hiking, the garden, and other recreational and educational purposes continuously by the pastor and his family. No mention of any church use. With no further questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Do you need your reserve time, Council? Yes, I may. I think the town's definition of religion, they propose two different type of religion, definitions, and we can agree there's no concrete definitions. They're just too narrow. For example, the town has Compton members for many faiths be a creed, denomination, or sect. That's exactly what the Unitarian Universalism Church is. That church has almost a million members, and they're a liberal religion with a bunch of people who come together. I suggest you don't have to be one specific religion to, or going to be one specific denomination to be part of a religion. But you agree that you have the burden of proving entitlement to the exemption, correct? Yeah, we do have the burden of proving entitlement to the exemption. But in regards to the religion, I don't think the court or the town can say, well, we like this religion, we don't like this religion. Unitarianism, that's a bunch of people, that, that doesn't count. I suggest the Tao or the Tao religion. Unitarians count. What do you say? They count. <laughs> The Tao and the Tao religion, that has hundreds of millions of people, and they don't have a, a leader they're ever evolving. And it, it, this religion, that was one of their founding principles. It was one of the books listed. In regards to anarchy, and I suggest anarchy, they did not propose our clients to say, well, what does this mean? Or how do these religions specifically apply to you? The fact that they're saying anarchists cannot be religious, that we would disagree with. In regards to a regularly recognized religion, They've been existing now for five years. The statute doesn't say we're regularly recognized, but for the statute to not speak to But there is, do I understand correctly, there is no, you, you describe this as a part, this is the, the place that you want the exemption for, is what you describe as a parson. Yes. But there is no church, is that correct? I mean, there is no, no central place where everybody comes <coughs> together for some service. In, in this <coughs> There is. They have those throughout the state. They, it varies on locations. And, and um, what are, are those places? People's houses? No, there are many different organizations. One happens to be here in Concord. Um, well, can you give us some idea? What kind? What are those locations? Are they, you know, is it a hall or something? <coughs> they can be very different locations. So I guess it's not. Okay, give me an example. All right. Um, one area 23 down the road is a an establishment and they have services every week. Okay, people. area, what kind of establishment is area? Yeah, that broadly, uh, I would define, I guess, it's a restaurant of search streets. So there's... So it's a restaurant. Area 23 is a restaurant. Okay. So they have their one service at a restaurant. Where Did else? That serves drinks. Yeah, well, they're also licensed and serve alcohol. Okay. okay. So, well, but I, there's just many, there's, we were suggesting a religion does not have the requirement you have to be in, in a special say church, temple, or what, where you're having your religion, it, where your service is, that's a service. In this case, this, it wasn't part of the town for what's more than what we're asking, so that patron that chose suggests that the tax are using it as patronage, that's what counts. But I would just finally point out that the court, lower court did not address that issue because they found that it wasn't a religion in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. They submitted. Council may come forward with that of Mortner and Mortner.
Hampshire court hasn't given much guidance on this issue, but the U.S. Supreme Court, they've given plenty of guidance. The town just can't favor one religion over the next. The fact that regularly recognized, I don't think you have to be show that you've been in existence for hundreds of years. I mean, that would eliminate Scientology. There's just so many different religions out there. Their definition was incredibly narrow. It just doesn't encompass this religion. I think that if the standard becomes, if what they want to see is what a sincerely held belief is, yeah. I'm going to say, when was the last time you showed up for something every Sunday morning that right. you didn't sincerely believe in for five years? Five years And don't the, don't the, yeah. don't the friends, uh, the Quakers, meet in houses? Oh, a lot yeah. of people meet in houses. Well, and it's, you know, there's a lot it's of, completely uh, relevant to say that we have met in many locations. Uh, one of them was a town hall, you know, for a while. Uh, there have been, you know, restaurants and There would have been uh, a lot private less, clubs I don't know, and the, if we would have said, um, you know, like, if, if some of us had been up there, there would have been a lot of less. Oh, yeah, sort of, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, you know, the word interdenominational, I think, is also quite important because we do have Church of the Sword members who are Christian anarchists or who are Jewish or who are, uh, you know, proponents of a variety of beliefs. The you can't be an anarchist and have beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, the court, I, pres I present to you the idea that individuals cannot be groups. Yeah. <laughs> It's a pretty faulty. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Actually, if individuals can't be grouped. Excellent. Everybody we're, disperse. We're all anarchists now. Everybody is. Whether or not you believe in it or not. <laughs> then Just then I would present to you that you there stand, is no lawmaking body. If you stand too close to anybody else, then you become. Wait a minute. <laughs> this becomes problematic. So then there is no Supreme Court if there are no if there are no groups. So what are your predictions? I don't have any. Predictions. If they make a if they make a ruling on whether or not the Church of the Sword is a religion, they're going to have to make the ruling that it is. Um, I would, you know, they're either going to try to avoid that statement or they're not. They seem to. Uh, they seem to be trying to define religion themselves. Well, they and the court or they the the, uh, the court. They're gonna. Th that's their job. Well, I think which extent. court is the question there. This I, one. I, I am not sure that the Supreme Court of New Hampshire wants to define religion. Itself. Yeah, but it sounded that's where the they're questions were going. <laughs> Seemed to me. I am not sure that's where the questions were going, or if those questions were going to figure out what the town of Westmoreland's attorney was trying to do, which could be two different things. Well, isn't the question of Did I hear you saying you, you kind of thought that maybe they weren't, they were going to try to avoid answering that question and, and go through some other kind of procedure? I mean, what would, what would that procedure be? Well, I could see, and again, Dan's the attorney, and I didn't stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. So, um, my understanding is that one thing would be to say, you guys didn't do this correctly, go back and do it again. <laughs> And that could be one decision from the Supreme Court. And the other one would be to say, we need to have a trial uh, in this regard and figure out exactly what we're going to do and handle it within the Supreme Court. You know, those are two distinct decisions that they can make without any further input from us. And when you say you guys didn't do this correctly, as in like the town should have done that deposition that they were talking about? The town, the judge, everybody uh, else involved. So, and, you know, and they might make that uh, a more strict definition that the town acted... Uh, without completing a process or that the judge did not hold sufficient hearings uh, and gather sufficient information for that. Because word that you didn't include everything that you were supposed to? There, there's all that talk about the affidavit? Um, I'm not too worried about that one way or another. It sounds like the sort of thing that if Dan needs to file some additional documents that he can probably take care of that. So. It would seem like a failure of the court system if they decided, you know what, we're just going to dismiss this whole thing because a piece of paper wasn't properly filed. I mean, that seems like a disservice to the 1.4 million people in the state of New Hampshire if uh, they don't say, you know what, by the end of the day, we're going to need to have that piece of it paper. It seems like they mentioned that they've done it a hundred times, though. <laughs> right, and it also seems a little so been weird to me that... to the people of New Hampshire. Documents doesn't surprise that were, me. Documents that were filed in a lower court don't make it to the Supreme Court. I don't understand why they wouldn't make it to the Supreme Court. Maybe that's something that we need to make sure gets into their hands, but it doesn't seem to me like it, there's a you know an iron curtain between those two things happening. So that's just my impression. Essentially, they were saying the Supreme Court justice 
that asked that question was saying, tell us what we have. <laughs> yeah. You know, what cards are we holding here in our, what have I got here? No looking. You, you, was that there? Do we have that? So <laughs> it's like, I don't know how you answer some of those questions. And that was, what do I have in my hands? What's, what's in this envelope that I've got in front of me? Is it an affidavit? Is it a coupon for Dean Sporting Goods? We're not telling, so I, either they had it or what they're at, the affidavit they were looking for, or they did not. And if they didn't know that they did have it, then <laughs> it's a silly question. And if they knew they didn't have it, they also could say, hey, we don't have that. But What do they do the, when they lose things? I mean, <laughs> they don't lose things here? Because it'd be the only building on the planet where they don't lose things. Yeah. And do they just dismiss people's cases when they lose stuff? It we certainly don't. wouldn't be the first government agency that would do such a thing, but, um, you know. We think the town of Westmoreland's <laughs> attorney probably did us um, a, a great service today by oh, yes. um, propounding his definition of religion that you can't be a, a Catholic and an anarchist, and you can't be an anarchist and belong to a group, and that we must be an anarchist because one of the books, although we had originally had a list of over 200 books that influenced us, we narrowed it down for them and said, among them, here are five. And four of them were explicitly, there were actually five, and four of them were explicitly Taoist. And the, the one that he mentioned, he said, well, none of these aren't religious and stuff. And he mentioned the foundation for Taoism. That, <laughs> so, and then said it wasn't religious. <laughs> uh, and then said it wasn't a religion, which is, you know, you could ask hundreds of millions of people in Asia whether their religion is, in, in fact, religion or not. And it, we found it, I thought it was interesting, he talked about martial arts schools. And I wondered if they had ever looked at the flag of South Korea that flies over, that's on most of the patches for the, the Kung Fu places. And, and by the way, um, they had the South Korean flag as a Tao on it. So it's explicitly religious. And most of those people wear those patches when they go in and, into tournaments too. So I'm not sure a lot of practitioners realize that, that there is a, a, that component. There's a there religious component, is. but of course they're not, yeah, they're not acting as a church religion. because they're for-profit no. businesses. That's different. Also, um, I'd like to point out that the taxes have been paid and that we intend to pay the taxes um, on the property um, for the for services that we use. I mean, I don't send my son to uh, uh, government school, so I don't intend to pay for government. I intend to take that money and put it towards my son's education, but besides that, we pay taxes. It's not like we don't believe in firefighters or we don't believe in libraries or anything like that. It's, um, you know, this is an issue as to whether or not this is a parsonage by elite. And we did have an issue of the uh, insurance company and the town saying we could not have services there. Right, you can't have a service on the property because yeah, the insurance company says they won't cover it. And the town of Westmoreland said you'd have to, we'd have to get it rezoned. But there have right. been services on the property before there too. Have. But it doesn't matter. It's not a church, and we're not saying it is. Uh, but it is owned by the church, and so it's uh, it definitely is. Uh, when they're saying, well, this is just because some individual living in the property doesn't want to pay taxes, that's not true. It's that the church owns the property, and, and um, that we're entitled to the property tax exemption as a religion, which we are. And the individual that doesn't want to pay taxes is also a firefighter for the town and goes and gives of his time on a relatively regular basis at uh, car accidents and, um, you know, house fires and all these other things. That's me. <laughs> and so, they asked if we, the I just ministers hate the had community. jobs. Hate them! <laughs> <laughs> they asked if the ministers had jobs, and the answer was, we all do. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't pay. <laughs> no, they're all volunteers. You see, it's all the a ministers sincerely held belief. Sincerely held belief. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to paying paid for it right <laughs> why well, would I would question the preachers that are paid <laughs> how sincerely do they hold their beliefs and is that a big Lebowski question do you have a job sir <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what? are you guys reluctant to admit that you often meet at the at area 23 no not at all we meet no, not, we sure not often every single week and um, we've met in the we met at uh, Simpsons Park in well, Manchester I, I, for I know years. You, I knew you, you said know. a year, but there was a bit of a dance yeah. up there, uh, trying to avoid. Saying well, your's dance. I have no. Uh, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it, no I'm idea sure why Dan was doing that. Places that are, have know. held church services yeah, right. is kind of ridiculous. Yeah. It's literally any a, uh, houses, parks, yeah. restaurants, yeah. bars. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't yeah. even. Parks, yeah. you know, Church of the Area 23 is a separate for-profit business. The fact that uh, ministers of the church are also owners of Area 23 is like saying that another minister uh, who happens to work for the Department of Public Works or the Highway Department can't 
somehow drive on the roads because he's also a minister or something like that. You know, we, we let the church use that space during a time that the establishment is closed. My school bus driver was a Pentecostal preacher. I mean, made money driving buses. I don't see why it's relevant. Yeah. But, you know, they, they ask lots of questions. They're getting lots of fans. They're trying to get put together a, a picture. Did you see uh, Brian Doherty's article uh, yesterday? No. Oh, well, he mentioned your article and, and, in fact, quoted you extensively in Reason. Oh, okay, cool. Right, so, I'll check it out. <laughs> Just type, yeah, if you do a search on yeah. Church of the Sword. From the Pastor Monitor? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nick, Emily, Emily, Nick. <laughs> And now you guys sit and wait, huh? Yeah. Ben said it could be some pretty undetermined amount of time, I guess. Since I have a yeah, job, I'll probably be okay. I'm going to guess. <laughs> I'm just going to guess that they'll, the they'll want to get it out of the way by um, the end of the year, but I could be wrong. I have no idea what I'm talking about. So. <laughs> well, and I would say sit and wait. Yes, we have to wait for their decision, but we don't sit very much. So we're just going to keep doing our sincerely held beliefs on Sunday mornings and uh, keep doing our other jobs in the meantime. So. Right, it has nothing to do with whether or not we have services. It's completely irrelevant. Yep. I just had them just held uh, services last, was it last Saturday? I think it was last Saturday, yeah. Yeah, there were lots of church services this past week. You guys had one? We had one. You know. It's not like you... I mean, New Hampshire's a smaller state, but... There's no reason not to have a church on the west side of the state and a church service on the in the central part of the state. There were inquiries from a uh, from out of state organization, out of, uh, out of state people wishing to uh, start churches yeah, with swords. Yeah. At this point, they're not qualified, but that doesn't mean there couldn't be some kind of change. We they need to set to. up missionaries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we need, so. missionaries. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, we're all individuals. We're a group of individuals. <laughs> <laughs>